Record 23, side 1. Lesson number 23. The 23rd lesson. Practical section. Entertainment. Thank you for inviting me in, Black. I hope your wife won't mind. Of course not. Mary will be delighted to meet you. And I'm expecting Redstone shortly. You know, it is refreshing to sit down and just talk in the evening, instead of being a slave to the radio or the TV. Yes, that's very true. Oh, excuse me. I see Redstone coming up the garden path. Hello, old man. Glad to see you again. So am I. Come in. Jones is here. So we can have a quiet evening's conversation. Good evening, Jones. Glad to see you. Family all well, I hope? Yes, thanks. And Mrs. Redstone? Can't complain, really. Now that the spring we have waited for so long has at last arrived. Sit down, Redstone. Have something to drink? Later, perhaps. I don't know your opinions on the matter, Redstone, but I was just telling Black how refreshing it is to pass an evening without being tied to the radio or TV. One becomes a slave to relaxation of a particular kind, I feel. And, after all, it's almost an impossibility to have a series of programs in the evening which suit everyone. We've got TV, but I have never let myself be seduced by it. My favorite entertainment is found in books or in listening to classical music on the tape recorder. Music which usually I have recorded myself. Of course, you have no family. One's entertainment must be planned more flexibly when there are children, especially young children, in the house. TV is a must almost every evening. It's too often lazy entertainment, however, and there lies the danger. Is that your wife coming along the road, Black? Yes. She was to have been home earlier. Must have changed her plans. Or, more likely, had them changed for someone else's convenience. I'll go and open the door for her. Excuse me. Not at all. We'll hear Mrs. Black's opinions on this question of entertainment. A woman's point of view is always interesting. She'll join us in a moment. What about that drink? Can I offer you whiskey, brandy, gin and lime, or orange, or rum? if some brave soul feels inclined. Thanks. I'll have a straight brandy, please. You, Jones? A gin and orange, if you don't mind. They used to call it a lady's drink, but it isn't like lemonade. Good evening, gentlemen. Glad to see you both. Good evening, Mrs. Black. One always feels so welcome at your house. 
I'm like the proverbial bad penny, Mrs. Black. I always turn up again. It's very nice of you both to come occasionally. I think people had a more pleasant time in the evenings before we had television. Nowadays, nobody goes out for fear of missing something interesting. We were just discussing that very subject before you came in, Mrs. Black. Your husband usually prefers a book, he says. I like the cinema or the theatre, but not as a habit. I like good books, but entertainment, in my modest opinion, may also be work, cutting the grass, tidying up the garden in general, or doing odd jobs about the house. It's better to consider these things under the heading of entertainment, because it's very difficult to get other people to do these things nowadays. You know, I never play cards anymore. And yet, I used to love a game. Whist, Solitaire and Bridge were my favourites. It's the price of progress, I suppose. It's an unfortunate feature of present-day life. Everything is tinned, from food to music. We enjoy too many things passively, seldom making any attempt to discuss a problem that has arisen, whether from a television broadcast, a radio talk, or even a play at the theatre. That's quite true. Today we are so busy working that we don't remember how to enjoy ourselves. It's not a good thing, really. Well, no one can prohibit us a pleasant evening's conversation whenever we like. And that, gentleman, is just as often as you care to come and see us. Thank you, Mrs. Black. You are very kind. Side 2. Grammatical section. Anomalous verbs, third part. Must. This defective verb is used as follows. 1. To express obligation dictated by the speaker. He must do his share, otherwise there will be nothing for him. 2. To express opinion of the speaker. It must be nearly lunch time. I'm very hungry. 3. Gives emphasis to an action. You must see that film. It's really as good as they say. Must is present tense and is the same for all persons, singular and plural. It is, however, used as a future tense, particularly when definite future time is expressed or implied. Must expressing past tense is less common, but is perfectly correct when it is dependent on a past tense principal verb. Study these examples. Present. You must go to school now. The children must get ready for bed. Future. Tom must visit his friend Mary when he comes in. Those pictures must be sent off before Saturday. Past. Mr. Brown declared they must be mad to do such a thing.
John and his sister asked if they must study before lunch. Must is, as we have said, a defective verb, and, as such, has no infinitive. The role of infinitive is filled by the verb to have to, which has a complete conjugation. We have, therefore, two forms for the present and future tense, as stated, and also independent clauses for the past tense. However, to have to indicates obligation from a source outside the control of the person required to do the action. I must do this exercise before I go to bed. I have to study a whole lesson for tomorrow. In the first example, I myself feel the obligation, whereas in the second, I am obliged by someone else, the teacher, for example. In the interrogative, it is always safe to use to have to, especially when speaking of habits, though must is common when referring to a single occasion. Here are some examples. Have you to be at the office every day at eight o'clock? Do you have to finish that book this evening? Have you to finish that book this evening? Must you go so early? Notice that got is used a great deal, pleonastically, with to have and to have to. The past tense is formed by using had to and did have to. Had the children to wait long? Did the children have to wait long? In the negative, must not expresses negative obligation, that is, prohibition or emphatic advice. You must not touch the vase on the table. It is very fragile. Children must not disobey their parents. You must not miss that program. It's wonderful. Our friends must not go without us, or I'll be annoyed. Here are further examples of all these forms. Present. I must go or I'll miss my bus. They have to go because their teacher is waiting for them. Future. Must they come to the party next week? You must come and see us when the house is properly finished. You will have to do what the teacher tells you at school. Past. They said we must wait until later. Had you to wait long for the bus? Jane didn't have to go after all. Interrogative. Must you spend so much time on trifles? Have you got to leave in such a hurry? Do people have to be so annoying in the shops? Negative. You mustn't use that knife. Mother told you not to. Mustn't you be at school at nine o'clock this morning? You haven't got to go now unless you want to. Ought. This defective is used 
to express an obligation, either present, past, or future, as dictated by one's conscience. That is, the obligation is a moral one. And this verb is sometimes considered as conditional. It is the only defective verb that is followed by two. Here are some examples. Present, I ought to go now. Past, he said we ought not to go without him. Future, the children ought to come straight home after the party tomorrow.